Today's guest is Justine Beauregard, who is a sales coach and trainer since 2008. And she loves helping entrepreneurs um, that like basically to move them to love what they sell and also love how they sell it. So she helped over 550 clients increase their income by a whopping 2,300% and most importantly, have fun while doing it. So Justine, thank you very much for being on. How are you doing today? Thank you so much for having me on. I'm doing great. You're very welcome. And and I'm excited to dive into this because like, you know, sales is is such a topic that uh, I think springs up a lot of, you know, triggers and feelings and, and all kinds of things. So I know we were talking prior to, um, you know, hitting record and you were saying, okay, I, I want to dive into an experience like this just to practice my own courage, et cetera. So Hey, I want to commend you for, you know, walking your own talk because it's easy to be kind of on this side of the chair and like delivering the advice. But then when roles are reversed, it's the flip side. Um, so, yeah, so I'd love for you to just dive into like, how did you get to doing what you're doing? You obviously have these great, you know, results as far as like sales. Uh, I'd love to know just more about you to kind of contextualize uh, the whole episode. Yeah, I love that. So my background, I've been an entrepreneur my whole life since I was five or six years old. Other kids were sliding down the slide and swinging on the swings. And I was laminating business cards and hustling, selling friendship bracelets on the playground for like a dollar a piece. So I just had this innate desire to create more freedom in my life and seeing my maternal grandmother was a serial entrepreneur and she ran a household of five children had a business, had a passive income stream through real estate, just had this deep desire for more. Like she was just like, no, it's not good enough. Like there's always this next level of who I could be and who I could help and what I could do and the example I could set. And she was at the forefront of like women in technology and women in electronics. Like she was one of the first members of that. And it was a very male dominated industry. Um, So seeing her kind of change the game was just this amazing example. And then there was sort of a generational skip where my mom was just, I have to provide. I'm a single mom. I have to work hard. I have to do the corporate America thing. She still does it. Um, So having kind of those two maternal influences in my life, it was always really interesting. I sort of had this belief deep within me for many years that I could create my destiny. I could you know, build whatever future I wanted. But then seeing my mom, it was like, wait, bring it back to reality, get the corporate job, do the corporate thing until you get to a point where you can do that. And so in 2014, I got pregnant with my first baby and I was the breadwinner at the time. And I had always had this vision of being in my fifties, semi-retiring, going into consulting. And I sat down with my partner and I said, what do you think about like what we're going to do with this baby. Like, are we going to do daycare? Do you want to stay home? Should I stay home? And he was like, I think you should start your business early. So kudos to him because I would not have done that. (laughs) It was very scary. We sat down, we made a budget and I don't do anything halfway. So created that company. And in the first year I grew from year one to year two by 1800% and started really making a lot of strides in my business. That 2300% um, growth reference that you mentioned in my bio was actually a client that I worked with who was making pretty much no money. He was generating about $3,000 a month in his business. And in about just under six months, I built his marketing plan, his sales plan, executed it for him. And he was generating $70,000 monthly recurring revenue. So I built my business on referrals. I love what I do. I'm really good at it. And kind of like leaning into this side where, yeah, this could be something bigger. And then about two years ago, two and a half years ago, my husband left his six figure job and it was like sucking his soul. And I was like, you know what? I'm making enough to cover all the bills with a little extra. We'll be fine. Like quit your job, stay home with the kids. I'll manage this side of things. And that's when I really noticed a shift in like my confidence and my boundaries and like all of these things as like this responsibility poured over me. I think it was first subconscious. And then it just started getting more and more aggressive. Like I need to over deliver. I need to do more. I need to do all of these things. Even though I had a successful six figure business, it was just this expectation of 
now it's just on you. I think that safety net kind of fell away and it was like, oh, okay. So first I was doing, you know, let's say a trapeze act in the circus where you kind of like run and jump the bars and you know, the safety net's there. And then it's the night of the show and the safety net's gone and you're like, crap, (laughs) I'm here and it has to work or there's a big risk. And I think that's where kind of, I started embodying these feelings of the overworking and the overlearning and the wanting to overdeliver and kind of even more so pushing my boundaries and lacking this ability to see who I was when I started my business nine years ago. Like this person who was like, yeah, I took that client from $3,000 to $70,000 monthly recurring revenue. Like I'm pretty awesome, right? On that side, but it's hard to live in that energy consistently and find ways to reconnect to it and kind of leverage it and all of that. So, you know, I'm grateful that you have this podcast so we can kind of process through some of that and go deeper and explore. Awesome. So, well, A, I just want to again, commend you for diving into this work in this way, because the majority of my clients by default are are, are high achievers, right? And and I think for people listening that hear your story and they're like, holy crap, like to go from $3,000 a month to 70,000 based off of, like, it sounds like not just your strategy, but also your implementation and and facilitation in that strategy is like amazing. Like how could this person possibly doubt uh, you know, herself. Right. So a lot of the times, um, like I have clients that have come to me that haven't gone on the podcast, even the majority of like go from podcast to like client afterwards. But one of the reasons is it's like, listen, I have an established brand. I can't be seen in this way. Right. Mm. Like I, I need this help, but I can't be seen in this way. So before we dive into just your side, I just want to highlight because you, you told me before we started recording, like, like courage is something you want to dive into, right? And I think this is like the most courageous example of that because you're like, I'm amazing at what I do. There's no re- like logical reason to have these, you know, feelings and these hesitations. The world is literally showing me evidence and proof that like it's, it's I'm not just like deluding myself and yet I can't get away from it. So number one, I just want to acknowledge you for that and you want to add anything to that by all means, and we can kind of dive into the rest of it afterwards. Yeah, of course. And I appreciate that acknowledgement. And, you know, I was talking to my assistant this morning and I gave her praise and she was like, wow, every time you give me praise, my, I feel my cheeks get hot and I want to look away. Like I get uncomfortable and I'm like, no, I want you to sit with the praise I'm giving you right now. And it almost felt like I was giving myself Like she is me, right? We are the mirror and all of that. So looking at her, I'm like, yeah, you know what? And Justine, take your own advice, like sit in the praise, like allow yourself to be a witness to the work that you've done. And I think that time and time again, even though it's hard, even though it's, you know, we don't, I don't like the word fearless because I do it scared, right? I do it with fear, but there's something about every time I get vulnerable, every time I am courageous it creates so much momentum, not in the way that you would expect. Like you think, oh, I'm going to be vulnerable and people are going to hear that I doubt myself and I over deliver and I screw it all up and I make mistakes all over the place and they're going to think less of me or they're going to think this way. But really we see ourselves in the stories of the courageous, right? We get to be with them and be like, wow, they're a human. I want to work with someone who's imperfect. I want to work with someone who's not you know, Pinterest perfect or Instagram worthy. Like whenever I tell stories to my friends, I'm a mom of two kids. And whenever I tell stories of my kids and how I was like, yeah, we baked cookies last week, but not really because they were making a mess. So I just said, pour the flour in and then go do your like own thing. And I'm going to finish it up because I don't want to mess in my kitchen. It drives me nuts. And they're like, I love that you own that. Like you're not just like make the mess, like go crazy. I'm like, there are certain things that yeah, there are times when I'll let them do those things or when things will get, you know, a little more playful or whatever. But when we're up, you know, we're going to a cookout in two hours and we've got to bake the cookies and I don't want to have to clean up the whole kitchen. It's like, we got a job to do, you know? And so it's those little things where I just embrace it. I'm like, okay, I'm not the perfect mom. I'm not the perfect business owner. I'm not the perfect wife. I'm not the perfect human. Like I'm just 
me and I'm still creating a six figure business and raising amazing humans and doing the work and appreciating these parts of myself. And sometimes it's hard. And sometimes I get down on myself and sometimes I doubt, or I'm in disbelief, but that's okay because I move to the next step and I always come out okay on the other side. And I think it's important to remember that, that the more we can step up and kind of bring it into the light, the less it has an opportunity to kind of grow in the darkness. And we have to kind of expose those things and just be open and be like, and this is true. And also I'm okay. And I'm great. And I'm thriving or whatever the adjective is that fits you. Absolutely. I think as you're speaking, like what, what I keep hearing is like making space for self-compassion, right? But yes. like not, not the self-compassion that drives you into like self-pity and kind of like not doing anything. Cause I think that's a distortion of self-compassion, but like honest, real, Hey, here is what's happening. Here's what's causing my suffering. And I have power to not suffer whether that's taking action or whether that's being kind to myself it's like you know what what's the right tool for the job that's a different question altogether but the general sentiment of I allow space and create space for self-compassion i think is such a important one so yeah 100 percent, i agree with you for that so i think you brought up a lot of things and obviously this is not your first foray into the work because how you like you have a lot of awareness around all of the patterns and you see it's happening it's just like I understand them. I just don't know why I can't like eliminate them. So um, if you're okay with it, I want to, like I've been taking notes while you've been speaking. So I just want to kind of dive into certain things that you've said and then we can work through those. Is that okay with you? Great. Love it. Okay. Perfect. So you, you mentioned the first one about um, like everything was kind of good. And then, you know, your husband takes the, the leave out of his six figure job and you encourage him to do it because you're like, you know, we have more than enough to cover everything we need, plus a little bit more. So again, there's that same repetition of objectively speaking, like the reality is giving me evidence that I'm actually okay, but something yeah. internally for me doesn't add up that way. So what's your internal dialogue or what's your internal feeling um, when you make that decision or, or when you experience that? I think it's like that not enoughness, right? Like we're making enough and then a little bit extra and I want it to be twice as much. There's always, and so um, this might help with context as well. I have ADHD. So there's something about my brain that is always thinking five steps ahead of where I am. So even though there's a logical justification for like, it's enough, it's a little bit extra, we're fine, everything's good. It's like, but I want better than fine. I want blow it out of the water. I want five steps ahead, all of these things. So I sort of get into that future thinking too quickly. Like I have trouble being present in the day to day in a lot of ways, like being comfortable, like with where I am right now, knowing sort of like that dialogue that I was saying with my grandmother and I, this wasn't even her words. This was my perception of her probably based on subconscious thought patterns of my own, but thinking like, there's always more to be done. There's always a next level to hit. And it's that just lack of joy being present where you are. And I think that learning the skill of being still and appreciating the level that you're at, like it's almost that fear or success intolerance where you know, I help that client create that $70,000 and go, oh my gosh, great. What's next for you versus like, oh my gosh, great. Let's sit in that. Let's think about what we did to create that. Let's pause on that. Let's appreciate that. Let's deepen into that. And there's a lot of that next level, next level, like the high achieving mindset you think of. And I don't know if people who listen to your podcast follow Enneagram, but I'm an Enneagram eight. So I'm very much like, uh, people describe Enneagram eights as bulldozers. Like we just keep crushing through the path. It's like next, next, next. We just go and we're very goal oriented people. So I feel like that is a big driver behind a lot of what I do and how I approach things. Got it. So from that perspective, what's internally for you, your source of security, is it the money or is it you? 
Mm, that's a good question. I think it's always a mix, right? Like the money is the proof, right? You see the money on paper and you know it's working. You're like, all right, I'm having a great month. This is great. Everything's doing what it should. But also, you know, seeing who I am creating that money. Like when I work with my clients, even on the sales side, there's two factors of success that I measure. And one is the joy of the work and the other is the results you create. So you could have incredible results, but feel like crap, or you could have really bad results and feel awesome because you're kind of phoning it in, in a lot of ways. So like, you've got to find that happy balance. And I think that's where I struggle a lot is I'm either like really joyful and like slightly below where I want to be, or I'm like really crushing it and like feeling a little bit burnt out or tired or like, oh, I just, you know, I wish it was more balanced, which is ironic that I can help so many other people create that result. And then I get stuck on it. Yeah, of course. And I mean, I think that's actually more normal than, than we care to admit. So if we could just rewind that a little bit, right? Because when I asked you, okay, so what's internally, like what, what's the sense of your own security? Is it the money or is it you? And you had said, okay, both. So the money is proof of me being able to generate money. Mm. And then when I focus on myself as the person who can generate the money, then I have this sense of there's never a balance and I can't find joy in it. So before we even go on, do either of those actually sound like a secure footing? Hmm. Yeah, when you say it like that, no. <laughs> okay, so so why not for you specifically? Yeah, Um. so I think, I mean, the money to me, I'm motivated by the mission. It's the money, as much as it is proof of success, It. I'm not as motivated by the dollars versus like, I want to help as many people as possible. So, so I'm going to pause you one second, not because I'm trying to actively cut you off, but yeah. one observation is like, as somebody who's like very smart and you clearly know your stuff and you're very self-aware, mm. oftentimes what happens with individuals like yourself, it's like your brain is really good at going into tangents that circle around the thing you don't want to look at sounds mm -hmm. beautiful, articulated really well. And it's always keeping you one step away from. So like, if you notice, then you can listen back to this recording, but oftentimes yeah. like when I ask you a question specifically about you, you will start to answer it as from like yeah. the eye perspective. And it oftentimes goes to my clients, people in general, like it's like, it generalizes mm -hmm. the thing. So like it dilutes what you're moving to. So Got it. in this instance, right, just the observation is, Okay, so we're talking about your sense of security, right? Because mm -hmm. really you're saying it, it just it, like there's no footing on where the security is. That's why I always need more. I'm never happy with what yeah. is, right? So there's no sense of like solidified grounded security. Right. And then when I ask you more directly about that, the immediate place your brain goes to is like, well, what I'm really motivated by is my mission. Cool, that's great. And you can be motivated <laughs> by your mission and never really feel grounded in, yeah. in right? So before I go on, what, what lands for you there? Yeah. Oh, that's so good. You're very insightful. Okay. Um, so when it comes to security, I think it's that every situation is different, right? My ability to create success for that client or a client doesn't mean I can do it for everybody. And if I'm struggling with my boundaries or my fear or these things, then it's proof that if I can't do it for me, how can I do it for other people? So it kind of resets the minute that those results are created. Like it goes back to my innate fear of not being enough or having those thoughts of like starting all over again, got to start from scratch, like doing it all over again is hard. What if I can't replicate that? What if I fail? What if I'm not good enough? And it's that narrative over and over. So I think as much as I want to say that the money or something personal is grounding and secure there, I mean, you've just articulated it well, is there is no ground. Like I need to find that thing that feels grounding, that it's missing, that it needs, or maybe it's not missing, but maybe I'm just not connecting to it enough or seeing it well enough. Yeah. So I would say it's, it's probably more of the latter, right? I want to commend you for like, I, I could, 
like I actively see you bringing yourself, like your brain wants to go one direction. You're kind of bringing yourself back to talking about the security. So like really nicely done on catching that. And again, if you were to rewind your answer right now, but it essentially went back to, so my sense of security comes from my ability to deliver something that makes somebody else happy. And if they're happy, then I can be secure. And then there's the rationalizations for that. Okay, they're going to pay me. They're going to refer, et cetera, which is actually grounded in reality. Like that, that is true. Yeah. And those are the consequences of quality fulfillment, which you clearly do. So then really we're going back to, even though you deliver quality work as like clearly evidenced by, you know, your metrics and results, it's moot if the intentionality behind it or your subconscious sense of it is, well, I'm not the source of my security. Like, mm -hmm. I know it's an obvious, like, okay, well, obviously I am, but it's like your actions don't reflect that, right? You had evidence that if your husband quit, you would be okay if all you did was continue doing what you were doing. So you're the one that created that. But you never feel secure, right? I always have to over deliver because I'm never secure myself. I always have to make sure everybody else is okay and I'm doing more than I actually need to or you know agree to. How can mm -hmm. I be happy when my nervous system is freaking out thinking that something's always about to go wrong, right? When you had the safety net, you were okay. Why? Because your nervous system's like, okay, well, we're secure, right? Yeah. Something else has made me secure even though I have evidence against it. But now that that's gone, right now, there's all that old wounding that's freaking out with regards to that. So I know that was a lot what lands for you there. Yeah, I, I was just taking a note as you were talking, because I'm like, yeah, everyone else being okay is the key. And I think me, I wrote down, I'm not in control. There is actually a lot of risk in how I feel secure, because there is that innate sense of security and creating results. And I've done it time and time again and proven it. But if every instance is fresh and new and there's so many unknowns and if they're not happy and that's a, subject, a subjective feeling, then the way I find security is at risk every time I work with someone new or every time I try something new or do something new. So innately, I'm giving myself security in something that cannot be secure because I don't control that outcome fully. Like Correct. Yes. Yeah. And again, very good connections. I know this is not your first foray into this, but it's like your sense of security is essentially external and extremely volatile. Yeah. Right. It, it yeah, ebbs and flows that. based off of whatever your circumstances are, which means you're never actually secure. Right. It's right. kind of like that idea of, you know, prepare the road for the child or prepare the child for the road. Mm -hmm. Like right now, your nervous system and your subconscious is so hyper vigilant about preparing the road for in this sense, I would say it's probably your your inner child, because yeah. that's usually the part of us that freaks out over illogical things. So right. that I think when it comes to why is responsibility such a big hurdle for me, lack of trust in self, I think is is kind of the the core there. Yeah. So if we zoom out from that for a little bit, like how is this creating problems inside of your business? Yeah. I mean, it's sort of like someone is hiring me to help them create an outcome. And then I'm almost relying on them to, you know, like I'm displacing the security within them. And so it shows up in, you know, some of the things that we talked about even before we got on here, like every time I sign on a new client, I'm thinking, I have to overgive. I have to overdeliver. I have to overextend my boundaries. And if I don't feel like they've left a session or that they've left even a conversation feeling worlds better, not even like 1% better, which is what we love to preach in the coaching world, right? Like just 1% better is enough, but like it's never enough for us when we're overachievers and we have these big goals. So looking at that and thinking, okay, every time it's I, it, it's almost like a clean slate, fresh start risk is at a hundred percent every time. So I push myself and, and almost, I would see it as like a martyr, right? Mm -hmm. Like we, 
are willing to sacrifice everything that makes us feel safe to make someone else feel safe, which in turn makes us feel unsafe. And it's a cycle of despair. It's like, how do we ground ourselves and create what we feel is enough? What, how do I do that and create what I feel is enough to have that sense of security always be within me and be within my power to tap into versus like the only way to create it is to just go over time on calls or over give on resources or always do everything that they want me to do without pushing back at all. And just being the sacrificial lamb at every turn, because it gets to be exhausting. Absolutely. So again, great observation. And just because you are so good at this, so let's just say everything you just mentioned is kind of like the first order effects. Like yeah. it's like the first ripple of this realization around security. So if you go back to the same question, how's this affecting your business? Like what's the second order, third order effects? How is it affecting what you do day to day? How is it affecting your bottom line? How's it affecting yeah. your team? How's it affecting, you know, the- Oh my gosh, so many detrimental ways. So okay. many. So <laughs> just for the sake of exploration, like what, why don't you dive into what you see yeah, as yeah. The second and third order effects? So the the things that pop up immediately, first of all, you know, when when you kind of pitch this podcast idea, you talked about the term head trash. It's like there's so much head trash. I call it mind drama. It's the same thing, right? It's we get into this space. I see where the things can go wrong and start thinking before anything's ever happened. It's like that roomy quote of 99% of things you think are going to happen never do, but we fear them anyway. It's going into every individual circumstance and thinking, okay, here's all the things that are going to go wrong versus like, here's the thing that I can control that I know is going to go right. And that is based on the logical mind, but that is only 5% of our brain, right? 95% is the subconscious one that has all the fears and emotions and all the things. So as I go into every conversation, I'm thinking I'm already starting off behind. So not only do I spend a lot of time trying to create some sort of experience for my client in that moment, but also after the call, I overanalyze and I over critique everything thinking, how can I do better now? How can I do better next time? How can I, you know, be more value? It's like that never enough story that always shows up. And then in turn, when I invest my limited fixed resource of time on the mind drama, I'm now losing opportunities to go fulfill my mission that I told you I care so much about, which is meet more people, talk to them, impact them, show up in a more powerful way because I'm carrying that with me. It's almost like a backpack and it's, I'm walking with this weighted backpack that's just weighing me down. So I'm slower. I'm more fatigued. It's not like helping me get where I want to go as quickly. It's actually holding me back, but I'm not seeing the backpack because I've been wearing it for so long that it's just become part of my body weight. And so as I walk, I'm like, there's no way that I can fix this problem because it's just like how much I weigh right now as an instance. But really what you're showing me today is like, take off the backpack, Justine, what's wrong with you? Like just, you've got this thing and you just slip it right off. Like it goes right there. You just put it down. And it's like, I feel like my body has literally fused to this identity where I just keep showing up in that way. So I'm missing out on money. I'm missing out on impact. I'm missing out on enjoying the process of working with my clients as much. I'm missing out on being my most powerful version of myself because I spend all that time really visualizing how I could improve versus spending that time tapping into my innate power of how I'm already good. And that's not where you want to be. <laughs> 100%. And again, beautifully, beautifully articulate. Like you make the connections really quickly. So, right. I'm essentially it's a, it's a hemorrhaging conversation for you, right? Yeah. Because I'm so hyper-focused on security is always external. And then I have to end up doing all these extra things that's costing me money. That's costing me impact. It's costing me joy, right? It's not being the powerful version of myself. I know I can be. So if we just simplify it in terms of time, like how much time, like as a percentage of your overall time, do you think you're wasting with all of the mind drama and the ripple effects of it? 
oh, I'm sure so much more than I realize. Like, it's really hard to quantify that because it's constant. And this is another sort of, I would say, block or problem with being the breadwinner and an entrepreneur who works from my home and lives in my work. It's it's very difficult to separate that. Like it impacts not just when I'm working, it takes my ability to away from meeting new people and networking and selling my offer and feeling good about my work, but it also impacts my sleep patterns. It impacts the way I enter into routines and even just thinking this morning, I was doing a hypno breath work session on creating consistency. And my first thought was like, consistency is hard because I have so much going on all the time, but really it's all mental. Like that the mental work, it's like, actually the more I deepened into those thoughts, the more I was like, wait, I don't have that much going on. And consistency is actually really simple to create. Like there are a couple of things that I could do to be way more consistent and grounded. And it, it takes that time, that practice of stepping away for me to really see that. And I think one of the biggest problems I have is giving myself that space to do that work. And it's because my mind is so full of that drama and that head trash, as you call it, that like I'm siphoning every extra ounce of that energy and time into what I don't have, what I'm not doing well, where I'm stuck, where I'm you know, needing to improve versus let's just forget about all that, which is much easier said than done. And let me think about what I'm doing well, where I'm crushing it. Like even just being on a podcast like this and having you kind of recount like, wow, logically, like you've been able to help so many people. And it's been a long time since I've thought about that client. It's been a long time since I've thought about any results that I create. Cause I'm so focused on what I'm not doing and where I'm lacking and what I'm needing that I don't sit in the joy and the presence of those results that really would help me create more feelings of security within myself. Absolutely. And I think what I would just reflect back to that is like, if you imagine somebody being, we'll make this more extreme. So imagine somebody sitting in like a room full of snakes, like all poisonous snakes around you. Mm. Do you think in that instance, it's easy to just make the switch of like, well, I'll just be grateful that I'm still alive and none of them have bit me. Like, what do you (laughs) think is going to be the natural response in that instance? Yeah. Well, it's obviously overwhelming fear. It's like. Correct. Yeah. And that overwhelming fear Is that something you can simply outthink your way out of or be like, well, no, just focus on the fact that they're they're not actually interested in me. They're just doing their thing. Yeah, definitely not. I mean, you can't at proof of your assessment and your courses and everything else that you do is you can't outwork, you can't outgrow, you can't outthink or outlearn things like you just... You know, it's, it's the most obvious answer. Like when you say that, my logical brain... Like, I'll just kind of walk you through how my thought patterns work there is like, Mm -hmm. I'm picturing myself sitting on the floor. Like, it's almost like in Raiders of the Lost Ark or something. Like I'm sitting down and there's all these snakes in the pit and I'm just sitting there and going, oh, there's like a shelf right above me. I could just cling onto that shelf and get out of that situation. But all I'm seeing is the snakes and it's easy hindsight or, you know, someone else's perspective looking in, like there's a shelf right there, just grab it. But our illogical, like fear-based mind is sitting in the cave going, there's so many snakes, like I'm about to die. I I don't even know what to do. I don't even know how to handle it. And we freeze. It's that innate response of just, we're not thinking about what the snakes are doing. We're thinking about how we feel. And so the more we're sitting in our feelings, the worse it actually gets. And so like, now my mind is going to curiosity of like, how do I escape those feelings and remind myself that there is like, look up, right? Like as one example. Correct. So yeah, I I think that's also a great addition to like the analogy I was trying to make. And the reason that I bring it up is, you know, what I told you earlier, like you're in that category of, you know, clientele that I work with, or it's like really smart, high achiever, like your issue is not the strategy, you know, how to get things done. And like, when 
it's kind of like shit hits the fan. Like you, you know what you need to do to, to move forward and, and make stuff happen. Yeah. The danger of that is because your brain has served you for so long to solve so many issues, people like yourself get into the, you know, man with a hammer problem. So for the man with the hammer, everything becomes a nail and, and they try to hammer away all problems, right? Mm -hmm. So for head heavy people or people that are really smart and have done well using their head to solve problems, what they end up in situations like this where it's like, ooh, I understand something differently. Well, here's the obvious logical conclusion. I understand I was making these choices because of security. Let me just drop that baggage that I've been like, caring because I couldn't see it. It was behind me. Totally makes sense. It's actually the right answer. And yet the reason why this stuff is happening isn't due to like logical logic. It's operating on subconscious emotional logic. Mm -hmm. Right. And the reason that I stress that is this is how people lose so much time get into these doom spirals of judgments of like, well, I know different. Why can't I do different? The reason is safety and security are hardwired to always go first, right? So if we're looking at bringing it back to your situation, all of these things you've mentioned from over delivering, I can't, you know, accept praise. I can't set boundaries. I have trouble with responsibility. It's hard to be present, you know, even outside of work. Of course, because as far as your nervous system is concerned, everything around you is a pit of snakes, mm. you know, and I know I'm taking that to the extreme, but like, th that's essentially how your nervous system operates. It's very binary and always filtering for security. So yeah. the reason that I make all of this kind of explicit is the real solution to problems like this is actually first tapping in and uncovering, okay, well, what's the emotional wounding? Like, where did this pattern actually start from? working mm -hmm. to heal that and then eliminating the pattern from how you show up in your business put a different way it's finding and nurturing safety in the business activities that were the initial trigger for it those two things you you can't really solve with logic you can understand them with logic and it facilitates that process but it's it's the wrong tool for the job it's like i need a screwdriver for these two things but i'm so used to working with a hammer Right. So mm -hmm. again, I know it was a lot, but what's landing for you there? Yeah. I mean, all of it, it definitely, yeah, I think it's interesting how there's something about being a high achiever that I find moves me. And I, I don't even really identify as like a high achieving person. I feel like other people may see me that way, but for me, it's like, I just, do the work, you know, like it, it's almost Olympic athletes. They, you know, Michael Phelps, he probably wakes up every day and is like, I just eat a 4,000 calorie breakfast and swim for 12 hours. Like that's what people do. And it's like, that's not what people do. <laughs> that's what you do. So seeing how I show up in my work and thinking like, yeah, that's just what I do. Um, there's almost a level of acceptance of it being part of the job of it being just there's just pits of snakes everywhere. And there's the logical part of my brain has definitely wrapped itself around this thought that like life is hard and business is challenging and there's pits of snakes. And I've just learned how to like sit in the pit or, you know, deal with it and not actually processed. Okay. Why are there so many pits of snakes? Like <laughs> it's taking the step back and being like, okay, you've learned how to cope but that's, you don't just want to put a bandaid on this problem. You don't just want to learn how to cope. Well, you want to fix it so that you're not constantly in a pit of snakes having to cope. Like that's a sucky existence, right? Like we want to figure that out. And so that's like immediately what I thought of was going back to where did this start? Like what, what kind of created that first pit of snakes. And even if it's not exact, even if it's not like this was the exact scenario, because whoever knows if we can find that thing, but just finding out why are there so many pits of snakes? Like, let me take a step back here and like sit with that thought of like, what if there were half, like not even trying to eradicate it, but like really just 
doing that work in a very different way that I've been doing it where it's very like, okay, this is what you do. This is how you manage poisonous snakes. This is how you treat an, a wound. This is how you do all the things. It's like, you're not solving the right problem is what I'm hearing. And I agree with you. I think I've been doing a lot of coping and a lot of band-aid fixes. And I really need to not have this open wound that's just been on my arm that I'm just like, okay, band-aid. And it's like, you don't have the right tool for that. <laughs> 100%. Neosporin's not going to cut it. <laughs> yeah, I, I listen. I, it's, it's like I always say. It's like I, I wish I had a pill for these things because I would work a lot less and charge a lot more, and it, it would be yes. so much easier <laughs> to like do all this work. So yeah, I, I agree with you in that regard. Um, yeah. yeah, the only thing I, I would like add to that is yes, like it, it requires the right tool for the right job. It requires the acceptance that. And this is kind of what I get at when I work with my clients. There's always this sense of. So there's like the business ROI, which is what we talked about before, as far as like, there's, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50% capacity that I'm just hemorrhaging and leeching out because of this unnecessary mind drama, right? Yeah. That could be reallocated towards more creative solutions, better implementation, all of the things you already know. So whatever then, like the business ROI of that's going to be, whether it's more efficiency or more revenue or both. Right. And then there's also the part that unique to like work like this, which is the internal ROI. Right. It's kind of this yeah. whole idea that I have with the peacefully ambitious CEO. Like, well, what does that actually mean? Well, that means you're peaceful in your ambition for more in and out of your business. Yeah. Right. It's I can step into, you know, from my office into my living room, be fully present with my kids because my nervous system isn't in a pit of snakes anymore. Right. Like I can do all of the communication things and set up the play dates with my kids or whatever. But like, unless your nervous system is such that it's not thinking it's constantly under threat, you can never be a hundred percent present and enjoying and, and, you know, like doing all the things you really want to do. Cause that's why you got into business to have this freedom. Right. So I'm both communicating that to you and kind of to the audience at large of like, that's ultimately why you do this to show up in a better way so that your life in and out of the business is better, which is like the rising tide that rises all of the ships. So again, well, what's landing for you in that way? Yes. I think you've just pointed out my biggest pang of jealousy that I have all the time when I see, even when I work with coaches and I go into that work and go, how the heck do they do this? Like they just, they show up at like at the hour, they end exactly on time. They don't think about me at all in between sessions. Like I just, you know, I envy that so deeply. I'm like, I want to get to that place where I just show up and I do that and they travel and they do all these things. And I look at that and go like, yeah, from the outside looking in people probably maybe think that about me as well because of how we show up. And I think social media has really made it more challenging for me personally and probably other people too, seeing this idyllic version of like, we live in this way and we have this great life. And for me, I see that and I go, yeah, I just see all the pits of snakes every time I see those amazing stories of like being fully present and then moving to the next thing and creating all the success and thinking there's this thought of what am I missing? Because I don't have the ability to compartmentalize these areas of my life so easily. I can't shift into like, oh, I'm just done with work now or that client's happy and fulfilled. And even if they're not, like I showed up and gave 100% of my value in that time and then I moved to the next thing. It's, I have this deep sense of responsibility to the people that I work with. And I feel like that deep sense of responsibility is actually misplaced now that we've talked, like the responsibility is placed on things that I, it's that, you know, I'm, there's risk in that security is like, I'm putting the responsibility on outcomes that I can't fully take control of. And also by taking radical responsibility, I feel like I'm giving them something that other people can't, but the reason other people probably can't is because it's crazy to do that. Like it's crazy to put all of this security into something versus going back to why am I great? How do I want to show up? How do I want to just enter into my life and be like, yeah, there's literally no poisonous snakes in this whole continent. Like I just go and show up and do the thing and I leave and I'm present over here and I do this other thing. And it feels like 
this Pleasantville kind of existence that's totally out of reach. But what you're doing such a beautiful job of articulating is that that's actually like how life should be. And so many people can have that. And that's what it means to be peacefully ambitious. And it makes so much more sense now why you've named your your offer or your business that because there's so few people in the world who have a peacefully ambitious business or personality by default. We have to do the work and it's hard. We can't do it by ourselves. I can't do it by myself. That's what I've learned is like, it's the perspective, it's the growth, but not to try to outlearn, not to try to outwork, but to be in it and then to do it and then to see it work. It's totally a mind shift that you have to make. I mean, I couldn't have said it better myself. So thank you for uh, <laughs> articulating that all too well. Uh, yeah, honestly, there's not much for me to add to that. You're 110% right. I think the only nuance that I would reflect back is, you know, while you were saying that you were like, okay, well, there's not a lot of peacefully ambitious CEOs like by default. So yes, I do agree with you on that statement. And what I've come to find is that like our default actually is the peacefully ambitious side. Yes, we Life get ourselves out of it. And all of these other things that have happened to us, again, generally throughout childhood, but not always, have just added on layers mm. that have hijacked our natural hardwiring, which is safety always goes first. And that's why it's so hard to like overcome that with the general tools we're exposed to, journaling, meditation, affirmations, whatever, whatever, right? Like you said it yourself, those are all great to cope, but they don't go to the root source to eliminate why this is happening. And, and when I talk about healing in my programs, I always say it's simply a return to wholeness. Like if you even think about being physically sick, when you're physically sick, you don't get better and suddenly you're like a better version of yourself. You more or less return to the baseline you were at before. You restore your original face. Exactly. Yeah. Right. So we look at emotional and I mean, to be fair, I'm guilty of this in some ways with my own marketing, because that's just the association we have in our heads. Like, OK, I got to like change myself and up level like where I'm going. That's the consequences of what happens when you actually just return to your normal wholeness and you just operate from that place. Yeah. Like, and if you want more evidence of that, just look at kids. Like, why do we like being around like laughing babies? Because they are so pure in how they <laughs> yeah. like laugh and do the thing for us that sometimes happens but there's always like this like little filter of like ooh, like am i gonna laugh too loud or like whatever right but that's yeah. what I learned right and that's just a nuance that i wanted to add to that is like the striving of that is actually through deletion of the parts that no longer serve us or what we're going to go next inside of our mission and business it's not fixing myself so i can be something else that's just really right pointing towards the consequences of things that we see out in the world and being thinking, okay, I got to get better. Yes. Kind of true, but it, it's a different path to get there. So again, what lands for you from that? Well, to me, it almost feels like then it should be easier, right? Cause we don't have to grow and do all these crazy things. We just have to restore what already exists. So, you know, that's the logical side of my mind going like, well, that just makes me feel that much more confident that this is like right around the corner because this is my innate kind of default state. And I even see it in my eight-year-olds. Like there's there was this beautiful just innocence and joy in the day-to-day. -day, and then he goes to school and he gets influenced by his teachers and report cards and friendships and all of these things. And he comes home and says, I can't do that thing because what if I'm not good enough? And it's like, where are you getting these thoughts and ideas? Like, we're not teaching you that at home. We're teaching you to be empowered and love it and all of the things. And it it's, it's so subtle. And it's from such a young age that I notice it even going back when you were talking, I could picture myself as like an eight-year-old girl just thinking, you know, growing up with a single mom, not having enough and always feeling like, you know, we've got to be really tight with our money and we've got to be really responsible with our time because there's only so much of it. And we hear the stories, money don't, doesn't grow on trees and everything is hard and you've got to do things that make you uncomfortable to get where you want to go. And it's like, do we, or are those just really bad belief systems that we've been programmed with and are forced to kind of take with us? And it's like, the reason I don't notice that backpack is because I've been wearing it since I was eight years old Correct. and it's just become part of the identity. So it's like, 
what is it going to take besides being on a podcast like this or talking to someone like you to recognize that this extra weight isn't actually part of our physical form. This is just there. And once we realize we can take it off, it's the courage is I've realized it's there. And also I've been so comfortable with it. It's almost like when you play in the snow or, you know, you're wearing like all these extra layers in the winter and you take everything off and you let you feel the loss it's grief it's you take it off and it's been such a part of you for so long you're like oh I don't know who I am without this backpack it's just you know it's also it that's why it's so hard to let it go because it becomes part of our identity absolutely and listen I mean I, I know this is unplanned but like like it's such a beautiful plug for like what I do because the, the basic core proponent or component of like my style of coaching in the up-level mind program is deletion. Like it's yeah. ex exactly what you talked about. Like the whole point is to delete the backpack. Now it's so much easier to move forward. And then yeah. it's, it's to use not the logical tools because smart people, if they, like if you know the tools, you would have done it already, right? So it's the right. emotional, the nervous system, the the, the healing and the elimination tools, um, which is again, exactly why my program is structured the, the way that it is. So I know it was an unintentional plug, but thank you for the plug uh, either way. <laughs> so um, yeah. I, I know we're running short on time, so I want to be respectful of that. Um, but yeah, this was a, a beautiful conversation, a beautiful illustration of so many different things. So I just want to thank you for for showing up in this way. Um, so yeah, just, uh, you know, floor is yours to let everybody know where to find you, who's the best person to find you. Floor is yours for that. Yeah. Well, first I want to thank you for the time and space to process a lot of this because it's rare that we get the opportunity to do that. And I, even though, you know, I, I often think about being visible is really interesting as an introvert. I don't like to be in a room full of people. I really enjoy having these deeper conversations one-to-one -one, knowing that someone listening might find this helpful, but I don't have to endure the uncomfortability of being an introvert in a room full of people. So <laughs> grateful for that experience too. And, um, you can find me at Justine Beauregard coach on Instagram, Facebook, um, Justine J Beauregard on LinkedIn. And, um, just my website is justinebeauregard.com. So I've got a podcast called people over profit, where we talk about growth on the business side in terms of marketing and sales and putting people first. And so if that sounds intriguing, then go check it out. Beautiful. Well, Justine, thank you very much for being on. I mean, yeah, we're obviously going to include all those things in the show notes. Uh, but yeah, that was a great conversation. And uh, for everybody else listening, we'll see you on the next one. Thank you.